Um, gosh, I haven't really. Ron and I talked about it a while ago. It's I haven't been to all. Like it's kind of spinning. Or in the back, which is understandable. You all get there's like a con right there. Okay, thank you. Not exactly. This is just yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 It was a little bit, I think it was 18 months. Oh, that's what it is? Yeah. I was like, it's worth it. Oh, okay. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Some of his colleagues were, are, are on the marijuana advisory. Oh, yeah. they came up. They came up. That's what that. it is. Okay, because I'm like, that's what it is. Okay, because I'm like, Start with some introductions. 
Uh, Bill Booth's been fired for five more days. Melissa Seal been fired. Kathy Adair, Deschutes County Commissioner. Kyle Collins, Deschutes County Planning. Robin Church, Three Pines HOA. Good morning. I'm Craig Lutz with Tamarack Wildfire Consulting. Uh, Ross Huffman, Oregon Forestry. Greg Brown, Commissioner of Woods. I'm Eric Crawford, Deschutes County Deputy County Administrator. Hi. Hi. Okay, introduce yourself, Dean. Yeah, we're doing intros if you want to jump on in. Oh, okay. Yeah, go, ahead. go ahead, introduce yourself. No, that's okay. All we do is a chair of the note. Uh, if you're sending on Zoom, please do your introduction in the chat so that I have it for the minute. Today we are supposed to have uh, Gabriela Rudikova from Oregon Department of Forestry uh, discussing forest pathology. I don't see her on quite yet. She might be getting on here. So uh, we will do some updates. Uh, sure. Uh, so let's see. Um, we had our community wildfire risk reduction grant kickoff meeting uh, last week. There was a few of us in the room here that attended that. Um, I think it went pretty well. There was uh, quite a few people from uh, Oregon at that event. Um, we, I think everyone has received their money at this point, or at least in our group. Um, so essentially, if we do have our plan in place, we have the ability to spend it. I think the big thing right now is coming up with our sweat equity program, at least for Deschutes County. Uh, the neighborhood coalition meeting tomorrow, we're going to talk about a little bit more on how to set that up this fall. And then I think uh, some of the groups that were at that meeting uh, just need to coordinate a little bit as far as our projects, uh, like Melissa, you're talking about, uh, and Greg, maybe we, you know, get together, go to uh, Shrewsbury Woods and, you know, come up with a plan and things like that so um yeah so uh yeah that was a great kickoff meeting it was good to understand it sounds like they really try, are trying to simplify that process um so i think it's going to work pretty well it should be a pretty successful grant process um for the firewise grants uh the fall 22 grants um that that should be due June 30th. So if you haven't turned in your information, if you received funding for the fall 22 grant and you haven't uh, turned in your information, please turn it in to me ASAP, unless you've already talked to me about extension. I think there's only about two people have talked to me about extension, but please turn your information. All I'm looking for is a narrative, um, invoices that you've that you had. Uh, spending the, the funding for the grant. And then if you have any photos of the work, we could always appreciate photos as well. Um, for the spring 23 grant, that was the money we had from Oregon State Fire Marshal this spring. Um, that is due August 30th. Uh, so keep that in mind. If you got funding this spring, uh, make sure you, uh, that's gonna be a much tighter schedule. We really aren't gonna be able to allow extensions on that because we are reporting straight to Oregon State Fire Marshal on that. Um, I am trying to create a fillable form. I'm working with our IT department right now. They're a little backlog with work, but um, in the next couple of weeks, we should have a form that you can fill out for that for that funding. Um, and so that's kind of the information I have on the grants right now. Um, any questions on that? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's all I got to report. I see Gabriella on there. Can you hear us okay?
Um, okay. Well, was there, I guess, while we're just kind of waiting for Gabriella to um, get linked in, any, is there any updates or anything anyone wanted to discuss, talk about? So I've got a question. Sure. Um, is the steering committee aware of the neighborhood coalition concept? Um, probably not. I think the people that have attended this meeting are probably aware of it, but there's probably a handful of people on that committee that are not aware of it. Uh, we've been trying to get that steering committee back to a uh, regular status. Um, I don't know if we've achieved that yet. There's there's definitely a handful of folks that um, we haven't communicated. That is probably something we need to make sure that the steering committee is aware of. Uh, it's a coalition. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that I spoke with uh, uh, Jim Larson, the president for the Upper Deschutes River communities, and um, shared with them information on on the subcommittee, right? Yeah. And uh, and so he sent out information on the on all the Firewise communities in in our South County area. And so, um, I guess it's up to the to those communities whether they want to connect with you or not. Right. Yeah, we did get their information. Oh, good. Yeah. And then, um, since we just got a moment to fill, I, I just want to say that I think it's really great that on the local uh, television station news that there that there are spots on what people can do to, you know, mitigate their fire risk. Yeah, there's a lot of and I and I hope that that message keeps going out because uh, um, I think that's really valuable for for it to be um, at the forefront. Yeah, yeah. There's been quite a few uh, PSAs put out lately. I think Oregon State Fire Marshal and then the Education Group. I think Ross, you might have a cameo in one or two of those. Or. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, there's a the thank you firefighters and then the fire risk one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Gabriella said she couldn't hear us, but she's going to log out the log back in. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so is everyone aware of the Neighborhood Coalition Subcommittee, I guess, in this group? Maybe we can talk about it just for a second. So we started a subcommittee that uh, meets tomorrow. We kind of have it uh, paired up with our project wildfire meeting. So it meets tomorrow at, at two, is that correct? Two to four. Two, two to four. Um, I think the main idea was to get a lot of these um, uh, firewise groups together, especially ones that have really been well organized and, and put together some successful programs uh, for each of their communities and get them together and really help with information sharing. I know Robin's um, a committee member and Dean, you've been attending a few and, and Greg, I know you've been at a few as well. And um, I think it's been a, a little bit slow process in the beginning, but I think now like um, it's really pretty well organized. We have some leadership in place and um, some geographic uh, representation in place. And I think just moving forward, it'll be really helpful, especially for uh, groups that don't know either how to become firewise or don't know what the next steps is as far as like, you know, getting their uh, community to a place where they're really, you know, taking action on defensible space. So um, I think it's been pretty successful. If, if you care to join, we're, we're always uh, welcoming uh, agency folks. If anyone wants to join, just to see what we're kind of talking about. I think one of the big, uh, subjects we're going to talk about tomorrow is that sweat equity program in the fall and how we can kind of work on that and then maybe some of the other grant funding opportunities and how we can integrate that stuff. Uh, a couple of people asked where we meet for that. It's at the county <coughs> department in the main conference room from two to four every third Wednesday. Yeah, we really need you guys to put that word out there too because I think that's the challenge right now is trying to get that coalition off the ground. Um, it's a 
brand new idea that we had. Um, and the idea was when we're, we're filtering all these phone calls on a daily basis of the same questions from communities wanting to know what worked over here and what worked over here. And wouldn't it be awesome if there was a platform where they could all speak together? So that's the idea. And matter of fact, I got a question the other day about Project Wildfire Science and how come I can't put those up on city property? They're taking, city's taking them down. And so how do I get around this? How have other communities done it? And so I forward that to, to um, Lon and the coalition. So those are the kind of questions that we just wanna get communities all on the same page because Deschutes County is the leader in this right now and we wanna keep it that way. Um, and so, yeah, um, get that word out there that there is this platform that people have questions, they can go to that coalition and we have all the contact information for that. Yeah. Gabriella, can you hear us? Good morning. I can hear you now. My apologies. No Good morning. I'm Gabriela Ritokova, and let me share my presentation with you. Is that my um, turn to talk and yes. give my talk? Yes. yes. Okay. And let me set everything up. Oops. Just a moment. It takes a while. I generally work with Teams platforms. I'm having a little bit difficult time sharing the screen. Oh, there it is. Share the screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, let me put it in a presenter mode. <clears throat> Okay, so I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Gabriela Aritokova and I'm the forest pathologist for um, the Oregon Department of Forestry. There is my contact information and if anyone wanted to reach me after um, the talk and I will be happy to share my talk with you guys. So uh, we'll be talking about the area from just east of the crest of the Cascades. Um, to the Oja Coast in Crook County, uh, County, and the primary species include ponderosa pine, lodgepole pine, duck fir, grand and white fir. And we also run into small amounts of Western large sugar pine, Engelmann spruce, quaking aspen, and lots of juniper. So I've been told that the Warm Springs Reservation in the Northwest part of the central zone has uh, 14 commercial species. And it's also worth mentioning that most of these species are quite common throughout the Blue Mountains and the Rockies. So much of what we'll talk about here um, also applies further east. So I mentioned a large number of uh, um, species, but they're not all over the place. And this map shows the average annual precipitation in Oregon during the late 20th century. And this emphasizes um, that there is a steep gradient um, right here that you can see of precipitation as you move east to the Cascade Crest. So within about five miles, you can go very quickly from about um, 100 inches of precipitation to less than 20. And why is that important? Uh, in this area, the species composition changes very quickly. Uh, that can change from a uh, mountain hemlock and high elevation true ferns to pines. Um, and this just speaks to the average rainfall. So from year to year or uh, perhaps decade to decade, you can um, have high precipitation periods and low precipitation periods. And when you go from basically what I call the feast to famine, 
it can set up trees and stands to be susceptible to um, all kinds of pests. So I would like to take a moment and just go through the different forest types and the typical diseases you find in each of these forest types. So the mountains uh, make up a small portion of central Oregon. It's just, um, just each of the east of the crest of the Cascades. And here you will find uh, mountain hemlock, western white pine, some lodgepoles, some white bark pine. And um, the typical diseases would include laminated root rot in the mountain hemlock, where you find um, any five needle pine, such as western white and white bark pine, you will also find white pine blister rust. And uh, dwarf mistletoe is common in lodgepole pine. And if we move a little bit further east and down the mountains um, and all along that precipitation gradient, we get into mixed conifer zone where you still have substantial precipitation. So we'll call it, or I will call it the wet um, mixed conifer zone. Um, here we would typically find Western large, uh, white pine, grand fir, duck fir, and ponderosa and lodgepole pines. I'm going to call it grand fir, but it's also called uh, white fir and is kind of a hybrid of the two species. In this area, we find dwarf mistletoe and everything but western white uh, pine and armillaria root disease on grand and duck fir. Heterobasidian root disease on grand fir. Um, in the past, heterobasidian was also called amnosis root rot. So some of you may be familiar with that term. And again, white pine blades to rust on western pine. We will move a bit further east and we'll still, we're still in mixed conifers, but it's a little bit drier. So this zone, um, this is also the zone where periodic climate shifts. So basically there are these periodic droughts and um, these droughts can really do a number on trees, which you have been seeing um, for past few years. In wet periods, you can produce a bunch of fuels and then in dry periods, it's ready to die and then um, burn. In this zone, we typically have grand fir, duck fir and ponderosa pine, all of which can um, have dwarf mistletoe. And the two root diseases, armillaria and heterobasidian can infect grand fir and duck fir. So when we move far enough east, we can get into vast areas of lodgepole, ponderosa, and there's also the mixes of two. These two species can also get um, mistletoe and also a lot of different stem rusts. Um, ponderosa can also get armillaria and heterobasidian root diseases and needle blights such as uh, diplodia and elytroderma. So now I won't have time to talk about all these different diseases that I just listed, but I will cover the most important agents that are causing problems in Central Oregon. So there will be three most important root diseases that I mentioned, armillaria, heterobasidian, also referred to as anosis root, root rot, and uh, laminated root rot. And uh, then I'll move on to stem rust and finally cover mistletoes. So um, root diseases are among the most difficult of damaging agents to identify, quantify, and also manage. They're caused by fungi or any related organisms, pathogens that decay the tree's root system. And as a result, uh, trees are affected by root disease. Um, they're weakened and they're more susceptible to secondary agents such as insects, um, and that can be anything from bark beetles to wood borers. Most root disease pathogens spread from in infected root systems to roots of neighboring trees, and that happens via root-to-root -root contact. But some pathogen can also spread um, by spores above ground. So before you can manage any root disease, you need to figure out and identify the type of the problem that you have in the landscape. So what you do first is you look up and you observe above ground symptoms that you can see here. And that could be 
anything from thinning um, to yellowing crowns or dead trees. And then you often see symptoms such as stunted shoot growth, um, excessive cone crop. And one thing to remember is that above ground symptoms indicate about half the area that is actually infected because we can't really see what is going on under the ground. So I wanted to show a few examples of above ground symptoms of the root disease. And here you can see these short, short leaders uh, due to root disease in comparison with um, um, their healthy, at that moment they were healthy trees, but um, who knows what happened after years of, of growing next to the trees that were infected. Another example of symptoms as mentioned are thin crowns, um, which often also appear off color or what we call, you know, a little bit yellowish or um, what we call chlorotic. Breast cones may also indicate the presence of any root disease. So although single trees can be affected by any root disease, um, these diseases usually indicate, um, they're indicated by a group of dead or dying trees, which you can see here. Um, and these, this is what we call the disease center. And these disease centers become larger and larger over time and can sometimes affect hundreds of acres. So what do we do after we observe the above ground symptoms? <clears throat> so first we look at the root surface search for things such as resin flow, search for um, evidence of fruiting bodies, lesions, wounds, dead roots, or even external mycelium, which I will talk about soon. Then uh, what we do is we use a Pulaski to excavate the root and the color of the tree and search for evidence of decay or any discoloration mm -hmm. or mycelial fans, which I will also describe soon. So all root diseases are spread by root to root contact because you can see all these roots overlap. The pathogen can grow from an infected tree uh, or a stump to a healthy tree. And in general disease centers I described earlier expand radially by about one to two feet a year. And one strategy to stop the spread of um, any root disease is to break the chain of root contact right here between healthy and infected trees. And that can be done either by thinning or removing stems or by planting resistant trees between the infection center and healthy trees. Um, however, it is difficult to determine whether the tree is healthy or infected in such areas if it doesn't have any um, above ground symptoms that I described earlier, that would be thinning or yellowing or that um, a cone, stress cone crop. So we never know who knows uh, what's happening under the ground. Many of these pathogens um, can survive in roots for decades after infecting trees have died. So if the disease stand is replanted with susceptible species, seedlings eventually um, become infected as well. And often this infection and the damage is worse in new stands than in previous stands. So I will now jump to individual root disease problems. Um, the three diseases that I will talk about are caused by <laughs> native pathogens. And these native pathogens co-evolved with um, the forest type, the forest tree species that um, they're affecting. So there are long-term components of the existing ecosystem. The first forest root disease is armillaria root disease, and it's among the largest cause of mortality and also loss productivity in North American forest. It is also the most common root disease in our forest. Um, the causal agent is a fungus called armillaria ostoiae. It affects all conifers and hardwoods to some degree, but um, is particularly damaging to trees that have been stressed. Um, on the east side of the Cascades, grand fir and white fir are most susceptible. 
They're readily infected and killed. West of the Cascade, the disease is most common in young duck fur prunes plantations. So that's about up to about 30 years or so. And uh, the main pathway of spread is by root to root contact. So what we see, what we look for is um, heavy resin flow and soaking at the base of the tree, which you can see right here. Um, Armillaria is also diagnosed by the presence of mycelial fans and rhizomorphs that look like there are these black root-like fungal structures that form on roots or under the bark. And there is also this yellow stringy de uh, decay. And in the fall, honey mushrooms pop up and are often found near or um, infected trees. Um, here is an example of um, the basal resin bleeding and honey mushrooms that are evident. And this disease caused a mortality on, on that tree on the right. There's um, the pathogen colonizes the tree and kills the inner bark evidenced um, by the white mycelial sheets or fans that form between wood and bark. And here are these fans. Um, they're, these fans are very thick and they peel away from wood or inner bark like latex paint. And here's a nice photo of both mycelial fans right here. And uh, these are the rhizomorphs um, that I um, described a little bit earlier. And it looks like the fungus um, has a shoestring that forms. Um, and it also grows through the soil from a nutrition, uh, nutrition source. So the pathogen, how does it spread? It spreads across root to root contact, as I mentioned, and by the growth of rhizomorphs uh, through the soil. So just like most root pathogen, it can survive decades in buried woods. And because of stress and soil compaction after harvest activities, um, the disease potential increases. Now, armillaria, can also be opportunistic and it can become aggressive when trees are stressed. And we have been seeing it in all different hosts and um, tree species. As I pointed out in the previous slide, species susceptibility varies by geographic area and east of the Cascades, true firs are most affected. There are several effective methods that can be used to manage the disease. Thinning um, decreases root to root contact and increases tree vigor. Um, PCT, pre-commercial um, thinning in Ponderosa pine and Douglas fir in some previous studies have shown that um, it has reduced tree growth loss and mortality. And then commercial thinning also showed some promise. However, if there is more than 20% of the stem that is affected, um, such stands really need to be completely harvested and planted with um, resistant species or tolerant species. The favoring resistant species in Central Oregon, uh, larch is a good alternative. Um, preventing other activities that uh, reduce tree health. Um, follow wound prevention guidelines when thinning and harvesting and also minimize soil damage. Shortening rotations in affected stands is also a good management strategy. The second root disease um, that I wanted to talk about and touch on is called the heterobasidian um, root disease, and it affects most conifer. I don't want you to panic, but um, the susceptibility and damage vary greatly by tree species and location. On the east side, for example, it affects trufer, pine, and Jupiter juniper. The two heterobasidian species that I have there have distinct host specificities and um, 
either affect first or pine. So heterobasidian oxygen tali is what we call the fruit type and irregulari is the pine type. Mortality is very common in duck fur and true fur. Um, additional impacts include reduced tree growth and increased host susceptibility to bark beetle attacks, but we do see that in um, other root diseases as well. And then of course there is the wind, wind throw. The disease usually occurs where susceptible species have been partially harvested or when trees have been wounded, um, especially in or, or older stands. And we also see this problem in uh, Christmas tree plantations. So what to look for? This disease is um, especially difficult to detect until it is too late because many infected trees do not show any above ground symptoms. So heterobasidian is identified by the presence of hidden conks, you can see right here, and ectotropic mycelia and typical lamination um, or stringy decay, and I will show some examples of that. Here is that lamination that I talked about. Um, it is heterobasidian advanced decay appears white and stringy with these black flecks that you see on the surface. And the tissue laminates and opens like a book. It's, it's quite interesting to observe. So how does it spread? There are two pathways of infection. There is the root to root contact or um, it also spreads by spore infected, freshly cut stump surfaces. And once infection occurs in a stump or tree, the pathogen um, can, and again, it can just move down to the roots and infect neighboring trees via root to root contact. And this continued spread of heterobasidian can create disease centers. Um, Repeated harvests within the same stand over time can accelerate the disease spread. So what is there that we can do for management? First and foremost, um, I think it's really important to avoid injury during thinning or harvest. Definitely prevent soil disturbance and other activities that, would, um, that wound trees and decrease uh, tree vigor. And after harvest, immediately treat stump surfaces with a boron containing product. Um, and you can see uh, what we usually <coughs> use borax. Bless you. Again, favoring resistant or tolerant species when planting or thinning to break that root to root contact. And the last root disease, and it's one of my favorite diseases, um, I want to touch on laminated root rot, which is caused by Poniferporia sulfurescens, and it was formerly known as Felinus viarii, and a lot of us are still referring to it as Felinus root disease. All conifers are hosts, and again, susceptibility and damage vary by species. So laminated root rot is most damaging root rot in Oregon, especially west of Cascades. It is also present north of the Crooked River on the east side. Um, the fungus causes severe root and butt decay, growth loss and mortality. Douglas fir, mountain hemlock, grand fir and white fir are readily infected and they're often killed. Now there is Western hemlock, large Pacific silver fir, subalpine fir, noble fir, shasta red. Spruce are often infected, but they're rarely killed. Pines and Western red cedar are rarely infected and almost never killed. And I'm going to show you a table with all these levels of tolerance and resistance to um, laminated root rot. What do we look for? Um, same above ground symptoms as the other root diseases. Down trees have these root balls um, and trees are often broken at or near the ground. The disease is ID'd in roots and buds um, by the presence of this typical lamination. 
and great white mycelium on the root surface and rusty red whisker-like structures that are called cetal hyphae. So the pathogen can survive in woody material in the ground for decades and essentially becomes um, a permanent component of the site. Again, it spreads underground through tree root system and kills trees in expanding patches that can be small or it can be really large. Um, and these resulting patches of dead and dying trees um, may be dispersed in the landscape. Because of the root and bud infection, infected trees can be unstable even without above ground symptoms. There are uh, pretty much three effective methods that can be used to manage laminated root rot. First and foremost, and I keep uh, repeating myself, is favoring resistant or tolerant species um, after planting or when planting or thinning to discriminate against highly susceptible duck fur and true fur. Um, the second is thin early to decrease root contact. And finally, um, excavate infected stumps. And that is a practice that is rarely done in Oregon, but it really works. Um, and here is the susceptibility list that I mentioned. Among the highly susceptible species are duck fir, grand fir, mountain hemlock. Um, into the intermediate group, western hemlock, larch, and spruce belong. Uh, tolerant, most pines are tolerant. All hardwoods are immune. So I'm moving on to um, canker causing rust diseases. These are rust fungi that are specialized and they're parasitic fungi that live on leaves, um, stems and trunks where they cause branch or bull cankers. Um, some of these um, rust diseases actually require two host species a conifer and then an alternate leafy host that allows it to complete um, the, their complex life cycle. However, um, there are some rust diseases that do not require alternate hosts, and I will talk about two of them. The first one is white pine blister rust, and it's called by the pathogen, introduced pathogen called Cronarchium rubicola. It is by far the most important rust. Um, and it's, as I mentioned, it caused by a native, um, non-native fungus, and it affects all our five needle pines, including um, Western white pine, sugar pine, and white bark pine. And it needs two host, hosts, and it almost always kills the tree. It invades the leaves and grows into branchlets, and then moves on to branches where the fungus causes cankers. This, these cankers then expand and move into the main stem, which ultimately girdles, um, the canker girdles the tree. There is no pine to pine infection in disease. Um, it requires an alternate host in the ribes group to complete its um, complex life cycle. And since it is impossible to eradicate ribes from the landscape, which we know as it was attempted in the early um, 1900s on the East Coast, there are two management strategies for the disease control. The first one is uh, planting stock that is confirmed to be genetically resistant. And the second one is prune to prevent infection. What happens is um, this method, the pruning method, removes foliage in the humid zone near the ground, and therefore it reduces the fungal spore infection on leaves. So um, the spore's highest success rate is in humid environments, um, and this pruning that I mentioned just interrupts the step. Um, generally, what we do, we like pruning eight to 10 feet above ground, and it is documented to be successful. Um, the next disease I wanted to mention is Western gall rust on lodgepole and ponderosa pine, and it's quite common. I'm sure every one of you have seen it. Um, it is also referred to as hard pine rust. 
And un unlike uh, white pine blister rust, it does not require an alternate host. Um, disease is evident in uh, swollen woody galls that form at the infection site. And you can see that on that picture here. The fungus is restricted to this gall, and you can see the spores that um, are changing colored in um, late spring, early summer. Infection happens during branch elongation, and it only happens on new tissues. Um, an individual gall is not that important to, to the tree unless it is on a main stem. The tree often doesn't, um, or the tree often doesn't make it to maturity, and it tends to break at that gall. Now, if a leader is infected, it can cause a bull or hip canker. Gall rust management is often unnecessary um, unless it moves into young plantation during wave years. Um, trees within or with main stem galls can be thinned out, or alternatively, other non susceptible species can be included in the mix. Uh, we're moving on to dwarf mistletoes, um, which are caused by arsithobium species. Dwarf mistletoes are parasitic flowering plants that can prevent growth, deform crowns and branches, and they eventually kill the trees. Um, they spread from upper to lower canopy as seeds fall. And uh, many species of uh, dwarf mistletoe uh, cause the branch on the host tree to form characteristic witch's broom in which many branchlets cluster around a swollen stem. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. So as I mentioned, um, they are specialized parasitic plants. They're very host specific. We have 12 types of dwarf mistletoe in Oregon mostly growing on conifers, except uh, cedars and spruces. Those two um, do not get toes, what we call the toes. They have reduced small-like um, leaves and their uh, seeds are explosively discharged from the plant. Sometimes they can reach 50 feet, feet after they discharge. Um, dwarf mistletoes do not need birds or any small rodents to disperse seeds, um, unlike leafy mistletoes do. So even though toe can be bad for individual trees, um, there is evidence um, that um, they enhance wildlife habitat, for example, the brooms and snacks provide nesting structures for many wildlife species. Oops, and those are the aerial shoots. Um, so the witch's brooms that I just showed you earlier can be observed across different hosts from Douglas fir to pines to Western hemlock. And here's the pathway of mistletoe infection in an uneven H stand. Since um, dwarf mistletoe spreads mainly by explosively discharging seeds onto nearby um, trees, it tends to form distinct infection centers around the initially infected trees, which often uh, were left after a fire or a cutting. So to manage toe or mistletoe, you need to manage the spacing of um, infected trees. The only direct control of dwarf mistletoes is to prune infected branches or um, to kill the host tree. Um, and if you consider your overall management objectives before deciding how to manage dwarf mistletoe, well, you need to, if, if that's for timber production, for example, if that's your primary goal, then you need to minimize the, um, you need to minimize mistletoe implantations. But if, however, biodiversity and wildlife habitat are your objectives, then retain some level of um, mistletoe on the landscape. If it's managed correctly, low levels of mistletoe will not affect a forest stand. However, consider that infection could spread over time, and depending on stand composition and structure, it can harm more, more trees. So the main 
way to manage dwarf mistletoe is through stem management. The best time to control the um, disease is at the final harvest since the harvest basically eradicates it from the landscape and kills all the overstory hosts. During thinning operations, um, you can remove the most heavily infected trees and favor non-hosts. Mixed species in one way to control dwarf mistletoe in both even and uneven age stands. With non-hosts, you can physically block seed spreads, spread to susceptible species. And then there's prescribed fire. However, it does not eliminate um, dwarf mistletoe from a site, but it will reduce the stand's average um, infection rate. So what happens, low intensity fires might selectively kill um, infected trees because these trees have that extra branching that I was showing and low hanging brooms that are filled with dried leaves. Also prescribed fire often kills infected regeneration. So getting to the end of my talk, um, I want to remind folks that a healthy forest has a healthy amount of disease, so there is no need to worry about everything. And um, my last slide provides resources that are available to anyone who is interested in more information. And of course, um, I also have that in my first slide, which I'll be happy to share. Um, I have my personal information, well, my email and anyone can reach me with any questions. Are there any questions for me? And I think I'm going to stop sharing. I have a question about uh, removing the roots. You said it's rarely done here, and yet this disease can um, survive for decades. Yes, um, in British Columbia, they actually excavate those roots because it's filled with inoculum source and all um, that can infect the new seedlings. So one way to not eliminate, but to minimize the disease that it's in the landscape is excavate those roots and remove them. But it's rarely done here. I have seen it um, in Northwestern Oregon as, um, as a project, a smaller project, and it works. Yeah, I got a question. I got a couple. <laughs> okay, uh, on, the, on your presentation on the, the average uh, precipitation of the state that went, went through 1990, now I'm, I'm assuming the last three decades, precipitation has even gotten worse. Is that correct? Actually, um, it is a little bit deceiving because we have been going through a lot of drought periods, um, especially since the early 2000s and the drought really intensified in, I want to say maybe 10 years since 2015 or so. Um, it was basically what I found, I found that pre seep map, I can, if I can show it again. And I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Where's the precipitation map? Well, let me share this. Okay, so it was a plot from from data, from data from 1960 to 1990. Oops. And I'm sorry, but I'm having okay. some feedback and difficult time hearing. Was there another question? Okay, my other question is though, approximately what percentage of the forest has been, uh, has the, these diseases or where it is? I mean, is it what percent, half percent, maybe 10%? You, is there any idea of approximately how, how, many, how much of the forest has these diseases? Oh, um, we really don't know. And so what we do at Oregon Department of Forestry, collaboration with Forest Service, we do annual detection, aerial detection surveys. 
And one of the things about the root diseases, I call them stinky diseases because they are so difficult to, to detect either from the air, but sometimes even from the ground because really more, more than 50% of that, well, the disease is happening under the ground and what's happening, it's, it's not um, manifesting itself right away above ground. So sometimes we think that we're walking in a healthy forest, but yet there is already something going on on the ground. So I cannot answer that question, but there are probably some numbers that I could look up in some reports um, and get back to you on that. But it is extremely difficult to identify um, and uh, identify these root diseases. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I'll be happy to look up some of the numbers. I'm just reviewing a manuscript about um, root diseases and it's really complex. It actually addresses part of the question that you're asking. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Thanks for pres presenting today. Um, in at least in southern Deschutes County, um, we have uh, mostly mixed conifer, um, lodgepole pine, uh, uh, true pine, or ponderosa pine, um, and the uh, dwarf mistletoe and uh, the gall rest cankers are very common, especially on the lodgepole pine. The, the ponderosa pine seem to be more resistant. Um, so is the strategy for uh, managing that? Um, I noticed, for instance, on uh, uh, dwarf mistletoe, a lot of times uh, it's the lower branches that seem to be affected more. And since it spreads, if you uh, if you just uh, trim off or you know prune uh, branches a little bit higher and get those affected ones, will that help the stand around it? It's a very complicated answer that I have for you right now. It really depends on the level of infection on these trees. It depends on the stand level infection of mistletoes as well, and your objectives, as I mentioned. Um, one of the things, so we just did a survey on Gilchrist State Forest, and we surveyed 72,000 acres uh, for mistletoe presence. And we found that um, it was, first of all, there were these cluster, infection clusters everywhere. And they were areas where the mistletoe in infection was quite intense. And for that particular area, what we would recommend would be some pruning of, um, of the trees, of the overstory trees, where you can see that the overstory trees with, um, with the highest infection rates, they're basically raining down all these seeds. Um, just pretty much across the area to, to these younger um, trees. And so one of the management strategies is remove those trees that have higher infection rates. And another strategy is just interplant some other species, because I said that mistletoes are very species specific. So what you can do is plant some other ones. So for, for example, um, mistletoe and ponderosa pine can get into lodgepole pines, but rarely. So sometimes we see intermixing these species that can help, but it really depends on, I would say it's a little bit of a nuanced approach. It doesn't apply for all um, areas. Before we make any suggestions, we like to go out to the, um, to the site and evaluate it and see what grows well, what doesn't grow well, and what the level of infection is. So it, it's a complex answer because there are so many different steps in between um, and before we determine what the best management strategies are. But I would say pruning out those really tall trees that are heavily infected that's the way to go. And then intermixing. Thank you. And then on the gall rust canker um, in, 
and just my own experience, uh, it seems to be pretty effective if it's on if it's on uh, the main stem of a branch, just to uh, remove remove the branches that have the gall rust on it, uh, uh, cankers. And then if it's on the main stem, uh, that tree has no future. So uh, just um, take exactly. those trees out, correct? Exactly. So what we recommend is removing those trees, because just like you said, those trees have no future. OK, then my last question uh, and the most uh, you know, head scratching to me is the is the root rot. Um, uh, near me, uh, there's there's an area that I would say is about 50 feet across only, and um, and it had and in this area it had uh, three large ponderosas that were in excess of two feet in diameter. And they just, you know, and I, they had been there for decades and then they just died. And uh, it didn't seem to take too long before they just like broke up and fell down. And I asked a, a Forest Service simple culturalist about that and he checked it out and he said it was a, it, it was a laminated root rot in his estimation. And, um, but, in the years since then, there's been what appears to be um, a healthy stand growing up in that same area, and many of the many of the trees are 15, 20 feet uh, tall right now, and they seem to be very healthy. So, uh, when you were saying that it can remain for decades in the uh, old roots does that mean that that whole that that whole area or possibly a spreading area um, is still infected so so first of all um i would put pines into less susceptible category and it's possible that it was heterobasidian root disease so it could have been other root diseases it doesn't yeah. matter yes um Yes, and, and the inoculum source does remain in there for a while, but you can break up that cycle by planting some other species. And you're lessening, you're basically minimizing over time. And the source of inoculum in there, the, everything that's happening underground, it's going to diminish with, with um, planting some other species that are more resistant or tolerant to that root disease. Uh, that, 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 sounds, that sounds good, but it's on it's on public land near me. So uh, I don't know that that I'm gonna be playing, that I'm gonna be going out and planting other species. Also, like I said, there's a there's a pretty good stand coming up in that same area. But what you did <laughs> say that that sounds that sounds good to me is that the pine are more resistant. So maybe that means that that area uh, won't be spreading in the way that it would in other species. And is this on forest service land? It is. Yeah, so um, it would be interesting to actually talk to someone, of FHP, forest health and, um, forest health and protection pathologists, because they need to know about these areas. And they have to go out there and, and look at it because all of this poses a hazard. Even though that the stand that's coming up around it may seem healthy and may be looking good, but if the root disease was identified correctly, it needs to be the cycle, the root-to-root the -root contact needs to be broken because down the road, you know, who knows, 20 years from now, you may be seeing the same problem. That's why I was asking. So what specific uh, part of the Forest Service should I reach out to? Um, Forest Health and Protection, FHP. Okay, Forest Health. Would you, would you mind sending me an email? Um, I, will. I will. I will give my, well, Corrine has my um, information uh -huh. and I can get you in touch with the person who has, um, who is a specialist, who is a pathologist in that area. Thank you so much.
it would be really good for FHP uh, pathologists to take a look on what's going on because they need to know as well. Thank you. Of course. Are there any I, other questions? I have a different question. Uh, I think about a year ago, five people in Oregon were killed by trees falling over. And uh, I drive by dead trees when I drive from my house to sisters all the time. And I sent pictures of those trees to the people that run ODOT. And I was asking them, when are those trees gonna be taken out? Because you can clearly tell, I mean, these are like really tall ponderosas. And they said that it usually takes a couple years. And I'm wondering, do you guys work with ODOT on the determination of, you know, what trees are really um, just fragilely standing and are, you know, take a, a wind and they're going to be gone? Um, it's a really complex question. It's a hazard yeah. tree. It is. It is a hazard well, I mean, tree. Five problem. people died. Really five good question. In one week, it was just unbelievable all over the state. Yes, yes, and this is the hazard tree problem, and it really depends. We're dealing with it every year. Um, state parks, forest service, we all have training, and if it's a public area, every year they have to do evaluation of those areas and remove the hazard trees, and I don't know what the requirements are and how fast they need to do that, but there are requirements. I don't deal with hazard trees. But um, yes, yeah, I can go out and identify problems, but there are certain steps and requirements that um, I know for state agency OPRD, that's uh, state parks, deals with that a lot. And then Forest Service and BLM as well, the federal agencies. Well, thank you for your presentation this morning. Thank you. I will be happy if anyone is interested, I will be very happy to share it with you folks. Yeah, I'll, I'll like to get the presentation so I can share it in the newsletter um, for Project Wildfire. Okay, I, um, I will send it to Corinne. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Bye. Okay, so we have some time for rounds. It's yeah. a little bit of boring. Um, I know last month we our presentation was a little bit longer, so we don't really get the opportunity to hit some. Operations on the list to talk about the prevention side because there's a lot of stuff going on there. But uh, with Ben Fire, um, we're testing for firefighter paramedic this week, so we bring it on we would agree to Chris in the next couple of months. We've also got a type six engine from the Oregon State Fire Marshal's office, which we'll see in January. That's our first type six that we've ever had at Ben Fire, which is great. Um, well, not the first, but yeah. I was going to see about 20 years ago was the last time they got touched that, um, which would be wonderful. Um, and then my last day as operations chief for Ben Fire this coming Monday, and he's going to step into my role as interim. I'm actually moving to Sun River. I'll be the fire chief down in Sun River. So, um, and then they're going to test outside for my position. So, we'll see somebody in there. That's it. For us, uh, Fire season's uh, starting to pick up a little bit, starting to see larger fires on the landscape. Uh, public use restrictions went into effect last Saturday. So uh, all lands outside of the Ochoco National Forest, uh, Ochoco's a little bit farther behind than the rest. Um, still pretty green out there. Looks a little bit like Ireland. Uh, we're, 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 gonna, we're gonna go a couple of small weeks and reevaluate up there, but uh, again, you know, it, it wasn't so much the uh, flammability of the fuels right now, it's just the amount of people um, doing silly things. So that kind of drove us in maybe a little bit earlier than we normally would have. Um, so we're, that's kind of where we're at on that. And then uh, that's all we got. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. Thank you. Look at that. Let's go. Thank <laughs> you.
Uh, the wildfire prevention side of things, um, as Kevin mentioned, we went to the grant meeting um, last week and some really good information coming out. Um, so be ready to see some things um, possibly changing. I do want to say there's one good website, a new website from um, OSFM, and that is Oregon. Hold on, let me think. Oregon uh, Defensible Space dot org. And that is their new website. And it's, so it's got all the resources on there. It's got um, a wildfire assessment sheets. So you can go on there and print those off. Um, so yeah, we're really ramping that up. And then the other thing with um, the Deschutes Rural District number two is that we uh, uh, we got $280,000 for um, Deschutes River Woods project. So we will be teaming up and you'll see a lot of fire resources in and out of the Shoots River Woods for the next few months. So that's what's going on. We're just evaluating and coming up with a plan on how to use those funds. I hope maybe next meeting we'll have people representing the cities here. So I'll have to remind them. Just, I think it's good. The information here is excellent. Thank you. No updates from you, really? Uh, yeah. Uh, Dean Richardson, Upper Shoots River Communities. Uh, we're having a board meeting um, this afternoon, and there's a lot of things on the agenda. Um, and I'm happy to see that there are finally resources coming into our areas to help our communities and and uh, um, <clears throat> and education and everything that goes with it. So um, uh, one thing that I have been hearing is uh, there are so many different outfits right now that are trying to help that um, you could spend all your time just, you know, following websites and, and all the different information that they put out. And so uh, it seems like it would be valuable to um, have some kind of a uh, an umbrella or you know a way to um, uh, to sort to sort through it so that so that people could get good information without being confused sort of a coordinate coordination of the different functions so that yeah i don't know if you call, call it a one-stop shop or, or yeah. whatever or maybe there already is something but but i keep getting um just in my emails, I keep getting um, information from outfits that I hadn't even heard of before. And then once I get into it, I go, oh my goodness, I, I, I can't turn this into a full-time job just trying to uh, find out who's got what information. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, so quite a bit going on at ODF right now. Um, so Ben Duda is currently back into his protection supervisor role, uh, but at a district level. So Christy is still going to be working as sister. Uh, Gordon Foster is back as our unit forester. Um, and so we have at it uh, Rick Fletcher uh, as the new uh, assistant uh, district forester. And then currently I'm in an acting position, position for the primal sister unit as our forest manager one. So. Uh, we are a little bit short on our forestry staff um, this summer. Uh, that will go till September. And then Chase Duncan, who works at a prime bill, who's uh, my counterpart, will be uh, taking on that development role as well. Um, so we're a little bit slow on firewise assessments this summer. So just a heads up for everybody, we're still going to be trying to get to them. Uh, currently working on a few grant applications with a lot of partners. So Community Wildfire Defense Grant is uh, starting to come full swing. Uh, we should be looking at two to three applications of that um, with each county. So working with Deschutes County, Crook, and Jefferson, as well as the local fire departments within those counties uh, on that grant application. So uh, as it gets closer and stuff gets finalized, we'll be happy to share that information out to everybody. Okay. Uh Greg Brown for Shisper Woods. Uh, we got we went we me and uh, Jeff Thompson went to the uh, grant meeting in Salem last week, and we're, we're getting ready to. I've got some volunteers for the hundred fifty six thousand dollars grant that we got. So over the next two and a half years or so, so um, 
I'm working on that. So it's going to be a large process. So it'll get done. Um, yeah, anyone else online have any updates or I could uh, say anything for the bit of the order? Uh, so yeah, that was a great presentation today. Um, a lot of good information. Um, you know, if you have any questions, I'll just feel free to reach out to Corinne or myself for comments or anything. Um, and again, thanks again for attending our project wildfire meeting. Uh, we'll have another one in August, I think. Um, yeah, we're still looking for presenters for that, uh, but uh, hopefully we'll get a presenter. And yeah, again, thank you. Thank you. I can't wait to say Alex and Yeah, that's Yeah, we're going to go with that. Grants, grants, grants. Oh, my God. 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 Oh,